Once more to another edition of In Focus, a live discussion call-in program brought to you by the Government Information Service via its television arm, the National Television Network. I'm Ryan O'Brien, welcoming you once more to our program. And again with me is Lisa Joseph, my co-host. And certainly, Lisa, we've been having quite some fun of late over the number of months that we've been having a program and we're certainly hoping that we'll have a, a very lively program today and that we'll be able to get members of the public to participate in our program today. There'll be the final segment where you can call in. We also like to welcome all our listeners on WVENT 93.5 FM. We're also live on Facebook and if you miss this program it will also be rebroadcast via the National Television Network and you can also visit us on our YouTube channel. So Lisa, Another Thursday morning, another in focus. And I'm looking forward to this one because it's, we'll be dealing with subject matters pretty close to my heart. We're talking about youth, we're talking about uh, uh, our senior citizens, we're talking about social security. So this will be a very interesting one, information packed. Yes, listen, as you know, veterans are very much part of the entire scenario, especially of late, and we've heard of the significance of them and how they society needs to continue to support them based on the historical background and their involvement and to even have us to where we are today in civilization and the St. Ocean society in general. Absolutely. Paying homage to our founding fathers. And of course, they also form part of our vulnerable people in society. And speaking about the veterans, Memorial Day. Yes, Sunday. We are not adorned with the poppies, but we are adorned with the color red, yes. signifying that. Yes, but let's yeah. get into our new segment so we can have a very fruitful discussion this morning. Yes, and as we normally do on In Focus, we start with our new segment. More than 1,000 young persons are to benefit from the Skills for Youth Employment Project, Empowerment Project. They refer to as the Sky Project. The National Enrichment and Learning Unit is now conducting workshops and orientation for successful candidates. The National Enrichment and Learning Unit, NELU, is responsible for the execution and management of the SKY project, which is being funded by the UK government. The SKY project specifically targets disadvantaged youth, including those with disabilities between the ages of 15 and 30. This project is aligned with the national, regional and international agendas on continued education and training. Country coordinator for Sky Lindell Archibald indicated that the project is being conducted throughout the Windward Islands with local support. Four years we are expected in those four islands to provide training for over 6,000 young persons. Training that would help change their lives. Training that would get them certified and skilled and to become employed. You are some of the fortunate ones here in St. Lucia. And as Mrs. Modest said, we'll be going around to three other centers to host orientations of this nature. Nelu is expected to train 1,150 young persons between the ages of 15 and 30 years in the next three years. We have other training providers in St. Lucia that will be doing similar training. Trainers include the Center for Adolescent Renewal and Education, CARE, National Skills Development Center, NSDC, and Springboard Consulting. Archibald indicating that the program spans a period of 10 months urged the trainees to commit fully to the training barring all challenges they may confront. NELU and other program will train 1,150 young persons over a three-year period, 350 persons in year one, 400 in year two, and 400 in year three. sherry Ann Julian is the Education Officer in the Ministry of Education, Innovation, Gender Relations, and Sustainable Development. This program will provide basic skills training, basic technical and life skills training. This program will help you if you have problems with literacy and numeracy. This program will provide work ethics and soft skills needed for you to function in the world of work. This program will provide internships. This training will allow you to gain employment or to continue training. After you have completed the course, 
you will receive a CVQ certificate levels one and two. Training will be certificated at the Caribbean Vocational Qualification CVQ level and will see a total cohort being trained. More than 35% of trainees will be male, more than 35% of trainees will be female, and 12% of trainees will be young people with disabilities. CVQ courses will be offered in districts throughout the island. For the Government Information Service, I am General Norville. And in more education matters, a twinning program between schools in St. Lucia and the French department is offering new prospects as well as social and cultural integration for the islands. A delegation of 20 school officials from the French Isles has visited St. Lucia to officially sign a memorandum of understanding for the twinning of schools in St. Lucia and those of the French dependencies in the Eastern Caribbean. The objective of the twinning agreement is to formalize and improve the already existing exchanges between schools in St. Lucia and the French Isles. Joanna Sultan, Consul General for Martinique, Guadeloupe and French Guyana, noted that a point person has been chosen to liaise with the countries. There will now be this plan that will um, lead to the greater good for both, both, both islands. We're looking at cricket being introduced into the curriculum in Martinique. We're looking at students here being able to attend the universities in, in the islands instead of having to go all the way to France or to the States or to England. It's just a matter of learning the language. And of course, the French are very interested in learning English. Likewise, we are interested in learning French. Fiona Meyer, Chief Education Officer at the Ministry of Education, explained that the MOU will ensure continued collaboration in the future. So this has been formalized and it includes 20 schools, including our primary schools across the island, as a starting point whereby we pray, we hope, we desire to continue to work collaboratively with our French counterparts, in fact, our French sisters and brothers, to ensure that issues of linguistic exchanges, cultural appreciation for both of the nations happen when we look at instruction, effectiveness of those, best practice, and it includes likewise our Saffalwis Community College. So we have gone not only from the primary all the way to the tertiary levels to ensure that language doesn't continue to be a barrier on both sides. The Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Honorable Alan Chastney, highlighted that due to close proximity, many opportunities will arise for both Martinique and St. Lucian students via the signing of the MOU. The ability for us to see activities after the signing are real. And the times that I'm hoping that our students from St. Lucia are going to be able to spend in Martinique with young people of their age and to learn the culture and understand um, the life of being in Martinique is invaluable. And I believe similarly that the young people of Martinique being able to come over here and enjoy the many festivities that we have here, the St. Lucia Jazz Festival, our carnival, we just finished Jeanne de Creole. Um, we have our Roots and Soul Festival. Um, and we're hoping that some of these activities are going to be uh, the reason why some of the students are able to come over here. The Memorandum of Understanding was part of a three-day visit last week. From the Government Information Service, I am Anisia Antoine reporting. The Department of Health and Wellness is continuing on its mandate to strengthen its public health surveillance system through capacity building training for workers at seaports and airports. More in his report from Funel Neptune. The Port Health Surveillance Training was aimed at building the capacity of participants to detect, assess and respond to any health threats at the various ports of entry in St. Lucia. Senior Environmental Health Officer for Port Health, Karen Joseph says, this training is extremely important and will enhance the knowledge and skills of workers at the ports and airports. Some of the areas that were, that were broadly looked at was international health regulations, which of course governs so many aspects of um, port health surveillance. We also looked at disease surveillance. We also looked at um, public health emergencies at your ports of entries and how you deal 
with scenarios like that. And of course, we have a, an upcoming cruise season, so we wanted to make sure that everyone is prepared and on board and knows know their roles so they can fulfill their functions at the varying ports of entry. Karen Joseph says she's very pleased with the training as it is expected to increase the competencies of the participants on ways to limit the spread of public health risk. Well, we're hoping from this workshop everyone will know their roles at um, our ports of entry, what they need to do in terms of, you know, health security at the ports of entry. And we're hoping that, you know, overall it would strengthen our borders and make things much safer um, at our ports of entry. The participants of the workshop included representatives from Immigration Department, Customs Department, SLASPA, Fire Department, Marine Police, and Shipping Agencies. Reporting from the Communications Unit of the Ministry of Health and Wellness, I am Funnel Neptune. Meanwhile, this week, issues relating to maritime security, extradition, human and drug trafficking, natural disasters, risk management and the promotion of judicial cooperation form the core of discussions at the seventh session of the Franco St. Lucia Joint Security Committee that was held on Tuesday this week. The Department of Home Affairs and National Security hosted the event. Nisha Charles tells us more on that. The Franco St. Lucian Joint Security Committee seeks to review security matters arising out of the exchange between the Republic of France and St. Lucia. These matters include mutual legal assistance, security at sea, enhancing the marine unit, surveillance, sharing of intelligence, and training of security officers. A delegation from both parties met on Tuesday for the seventh session of the joint security meeting. Minister for Home Affairs, Justice and National Security, Senator Humangel Francis, says these concerns have been a topic of discussion for the past 15 years. This security conference represents the continuation of close ties and vibrant relationships between the two countries. And may I add very early that Martinique has been a very good neighbor to us. Through thick and thin, the French government has been responsive, interactive, and supportive, be it on security matters, cultural, medical, educational, and technical cooperation. However, against this backdrop, backdrop, we are here to ensure that our law enforcement issues are addressed efficiently and innovatively so that our borders and our people are safe we have to seriously improve the pace of our follow-up actions. The Ambassador of France in St. Lucia, His Excellency, Philippe Ardenas, is optimistic that there would be progress following recommendations from previous meetings held by the committee. As you know, we are uh, neighbors between uh, uh, Martinique and, uh, and St. Lucia. And as neighbors, we share the, the same uh, problems about, uh, about security, also problems about safety. Should we have a hurricane, for instance, we need to be able to, to work uh, closer together to have good co coordination. So it's at the same time safety and, uh, and security. And uh, we need to, uh, to face the, the same threats, uh, illegal immigration, uh, terrorism that could, uh, that, that could uh, happen, uh, drug trafficking. So uh, if we work together, I think we, uh, we, can do, uh, we can do better. Also forming part of the meeting were members of the French parliament. The parliamentarians are hoping for further collaboration between the French and the Caribbean on not only matters of security, but health and the environment. It's better to be together uh, rather than to be alone. It's not possible alone to make something good about the uh, uh, environment, but uh, together it's, uh, it's uh, a lot of better, uh, a lot of uh, projects together. Yeah, Beranger said the most important thing, <laughs> really, because <laughs> in front of the climate change, you the little states, you are um, the, the you you will be the first victims, and uh, us we are uh, um, very far from uh, this problem, and we know that uh, it's uh, here in the overseas that we can uh, really uh, fight against the climate change. The Franco St. Lucia Joint Security Committee was born out of a memorandum of understanding between the government of St. Lucia and the French in 2004.
Yes, Lisa, so we've had our four reports used today, and maybe we can start with that last one from Nisha Charles on the seventh session of the Franco St. Lucia Joint Security Committee. Uh, yeah, this forum is important for us, Ryan, because we, we had the Minister for National Security on just about a week ago, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, yeah. Right. And he articulated m more uh, than anyone else possibly can the importance of ensuring that our borders are secure. When it comes to Martinique, we've often heard the stories um, of the, the gun trade, um, the illicit trade that goes on there. But most importantly, the uh, French officials also raised the question of climate change. We need all of the partners that we possibly can find in the global community to help us battle this. Not only do we need the financing, but we need the cooperation of the developed world to understand that we are at the, we are the ones at the receiving end of climate change. So whatever they do affects us. And if we can get them to understand that changing their behavior nationally is important for our own survival, then we are a step closer. So for this specific forum, climate change came to the fore alongside the idea of security from crime and, and illicit activity. And I think geographical location will play a very important part in that as well. Funnel Neptune's report on the surveillance at uh, seaports and airports. Yeah, uh, for us, again, health matters and the securing of borders the understanding that because we are now part of this global community and everyone is traveling. I think the last time we I had a St. Lucian who said hello all the way from Nigeria. Morning to you, um, Jasmine, if she's watching this time around. And so we are, at, again, at a vulnerable state. We are open, susceptible to diseases that we may think happening so far away, but once you have travel coming into the mix, you are now, I don't want to say we are inviting, but certainly because people are coming in and out, um, you are now more than ever open to your borders be having to deal with certain conditions and diseases. So this is important mm -hmm. for us to be able to build that capacity of surveillance at our ports. Definitely, yeah. and a very important story that Anissa Antoine brought us was the whole aspect of twinning, and we know that we schools were one. very much involved, yeah. and it opened so many avenues for our students and that of the, the French department, so it was quite interesting. I love one. this one because it sent me back a few years, uh, not telling anything about the age, but I remember at secondary school, we had that twinning program, and uh, French was never my strong suit. Spanish was always so much better for me, but... Going on these trips, you know, during the summer, you have the, the Christmas break, it was quite an experience. And I think sometimes, you know, adults, um, you, you gloss over these sort of experiences that young people can have and how we can really shape them outside of the academic mold. Um, and I heard in the report speaking to, to the social and cultural integration this, I think, takes you far beyond just the academic integration because you learn the French and you keep it at the basic level for you to be able to have a conversation with someone. But when you begin to immerse yourself in how the French live and how you can connect your own solution experience to theirs, then you're beginning to see true exchanges happening between the countries. And let's not forget that not only can you get scholarships for you to be able to study in France and other of the um, French territories, but also it's an economic uh, area just waiting for you. It's right there. It's right next door. We've seen the integration within the OECS of Martinique. Now we have Guadeloupe. And the, these countries present us with such an opportunity for us to be able to sell our services, our products. You know, so it, it's about time that we open up more to the idea of embracing our brothers and sisters in the French department because it can do well for us. Well, Janelle Norvell's report was at the top of our reports, but it leads quite well into us, our next segment where she was speaking about the number of persons who are going to benefit from the Skills for Youth Empowerment Project. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this one, well, it's with the Windward Islands and some in the region of 9.1 um, million pounds that the UK government has sponsored um, this project to. Uh, this allow, what I love about this, because we've had other training programs, um, but this one, the incorporation of persons with disabilities, I think for me is quite a highlight because we have disabilities now it's no longer just about someone missing a limb or some deformity if you will but they are the scale the scope of disabilities um and it gives those citizens a real chance of having a real life and not having to depend solely on a family member to give them a little stipend at the end of the month but it also gives them a sense of purpose in their lives so that they can know that yes i may be disabled in one way or the other but it doesn't mean i am not able to do anything so i love this component in the sky project and i do hope that when this program is completed we will be able to see persons with disabilities taking a greater sense of ownership and participation in our economy. I'm not just very happy about this. One of the quick points on the twinning, it's not new, as I said, at school we had that as well, but the idea now that it has become more of a formalized, because before what you had that school, school to school sort, sort of thing, but now we have the Ministry of External Affairs directly involved it now creates a, 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 a deeper channel at which and at higher level at which you can have a cooperation take place. And so it's not solely dependent on whether there's a teacher at a school with a passion for it, but you give it a, a, a sustainable framework within which for it to thrive. So I just wanted to make that quick point. Well, wonderful. That brings us to the end of our first segment on In Focus. We'll be back in just a moment, so stay with us and keep the focus. Préparation et prenez nos quartiers de manger méritent en chaque proportion, particulièrement après un désastre. Millions de conseils qui peuvent empêcher ou joindre une maladie. Faites attention au cas de manger. Examinez bien pour voir si vous mangez et gardez pour date où vous méritez de passer le corps. Le cas de viande à la main bouchée, gardez pour ce temps de libérement. La ministre santé, qui a mis le qui viande salade et examiné et est satisfait pour vendre. Pas de viande, poisson, viande poule et bien l'autre manger qui méritait rester à souffrir pour plus qu'il. Quatre litres de eau et bien on marche nous. Lavez la main bien et puis savon et glou tiède avant et dix ou trente ou quinze entamé viande qui peut coûter cuite. Servez mon sur planche et l'autre bagage à part pour couper viande qui pas cuite. Mettez les stocks manger cuite en fait de la même après vous servez et pas tenez les pour plus qui dé pour trois jours et les ou qu'à vivre chauffé fait à six et il chauffe pile. Changer manger propre car un peu chez maladie ou pour caution. Si vous voulez plus d'informations, cliquez bio information santé à numéro 468 secteur 49. If you are in receipt of an abnormally high bill, it is highly possible that you have a leak. That leak may not always be visible. Before you contact Wasco, conduct a do-it-yourself test. 1. Record your meter reading. 2. Do not use water for 30 minutes to 1 hour. 3. Take another meter reading. If the reading changes, you have a leak. Contact a plumber to identify and fix the leak at the earliest. A message brought to you by the Water and Sewage Company Incorporated, Wasco. Bon la mer, c'est un bon place pour nier un bon temps. Mais c'est faux qu'on ait sin tsunami. Sous bon la mer, qu'on sente terre qu'à prendre un pile. BC, couvert pau, et espéré semblante à deux bouts. So well, America, which is like a kitty lance la vitman. Who is with the pure? So turn America fair to all this old. Who is with the pure? So when nepotism is allowed, who is with the pure? Who is with the pure? The troisième etage of Kai, and espere les autorités annonce où ça descend. Who is, who is, who is with the pure? Apprend les signes tsunami. La pépane a 7 ans pour annoncer un tsunami qui a approché. 
C'est une commission par groupe management des arts bien fort et classe management des arts en saint louis et financée par l'Agence pour le développement international Amérique, Bureau Assistance des Arts de l'autre pays. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us. Remind you that you're watching In Focus live on the Government Information Service via the National Television Network. And you're also listening to us on WVENT 93.5. And we're also live on Facebook. At some point in our program, we'll give an opportunity to call in. And if you're unable to get close to a telephone, we will definitely accommodate you via our Facebook feed. Well, this is the time of our program that we allow you to introduce our guests and we're hoping that we're going to have just as much an interesting and informative section as we've normally had in the past. Well, we can't help but have that because uh, our guest is someone who has always been um, very uh, in tune, let's put it this way, with what's happening in the country, with certainly his portfolio allows him to have a firm grasp of where we are at as a people. And I'm speaking about the Minister for Equity, Social Justice, Local Government, and Empowerment, Senator uh, Honorable Leonard Montout. Good morning. And oh, let me just add that also the parliamentary representative for Grosse So let's not omit that. Oh, very important. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> let's not omit that. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for accepting our invite. We've wanted you here for quite some time. Yeah. I know that your schedule must have been very, very hectic, but we're happy that you finally made it. It's um, a pleasure to be here. Yes. Mm, yeah. For your ministry has, I think, the responsibility of, as I said, you know, firm grasp of what's happening to us as a people. So really the pulse of the country, I think, yes. of where we are at developmentally. Um, the poverty, um, the idea of social justice, um, just the security of our vulnerable. We're talking about our young persons and our senior citizens. For you, what has th the last three years been like for you trying to organize um, mm -hmm. and put St. Lucia on a firm footing where equity and social justice is concerned? Well, I must uh, say in a nutshell, very challenging. I say so because, of course, um, resources is always an issue. There's always much more to be done than there are resources to get it done. Uh, another thing is I find the peace at which government operates is very frustrating to me. I you know, must say that. And of course the demands. I mean, there are many demands, not just local, but also international and regional. I say, when I speak of international demands, for example, our legislative agenda is driven by and large to a great extent by the kind of treaties that we sign on to. For instance, you will recall that last year, November, about a year ago, we passed some child protection, child adoption legislation Quite apart from the fact that it is fitting that this legislation be enacted, we are under obligation to do it because of the various international treaties that we are party to. And having signed on to those treaties, we must demonstrate the goodwill by sh ensuring that we are uh, showing that we are implementing. Implementation is not just legislation, by the way. Having passed the legislation that has serious implications for many adjustments that are to be made in our institutions, in our policies, you know, in how we do things currently. And I am afraid to say that in that regard, we are still lagging behind. So there's a lot to be done between now, say, and the next two years to ensure that we get up to scratch and to be on par with what is required and what is expected of us. For instance, a child is defined now up to the age of 18. It has implications for a lot of things. Incarceration, for example. Where do you now you know, keep an 18-year-old? You cannot have an 18-year-old in, in the same jurisdiction as adults and so on. So all, all of those factors, you know, have far-reaching effects and um, significant res resource financial demands. Yeah, and it also 
with the Productive Child Maintenance as well. So that now That's changes. Right. Well, and we now we have to that. review all of those things. I mean, a number of things from, uh, social, from a social standpoint that we have to take another look at child maintenance. Yes, the legislation governing child maintenance, how much is a parent supposed to provide for maintenance of a child? I mean, realistic figures, not what we have now, but realistic figures. We have to work that out and be in tune with the reality of today. We talk of pensioners. That is our responsibility as well. Retirees, people, people who have, you know, paid their dues. The elderly, we have to just, not just look at the elderly, but enact policies because we don't have specific policies for the elderly. It is my dream that very soon we can see a unit that is responsible for the elderly. We have gender relations, we have various units, but there is not a specific unit that is dedicated to the causes and the needs of the elderly. And I'm hoping that we can, perhaps before I make my departure, begin to make some serious strides in enacting a department that is responsible for that. You've been very vocal about how the society views and treats um, the elderly, the senior citizens. And I've heard you say before that the obligation of families to the to senior citizens and to the elderly right. is it cannot be omitted from the equation of how they're taken care of because we have a number of elderly individuals who are living alone that's correct um sometimes family members are in effect almost turn their backs they're not ensuring that they have meals at least not three meals a day um, some of them are, are living in abject poverty when mm -hmm. you look at the, the, the structures, the homes, it broken down. So how, do, how does your ministry seek to address that area? Well, for now, given the fact that we do not have the structures in place to really effectively implement uh, programs and we don't have the policies in place as yet to drive those programs, we have to begin to engage in advocacy for one. I, I have, for, for my part, been saying quite um, vocally that the onus should not be just on government, as you quite rightly indicated. I've said that the family has to play a role. Because even if the government steps in, I mean, given the fact that we have limited resources, we cannot provide everything that would be required. If the family plays a part, then much more can be achieved. Not only that, but even when we provide institutions, there's no question, there's no doubt that the, f the family environment, the home setting, is a far more comfortable and more suitable setting for the individual than it would be at an, an institution. Taking someone to an institution very often is taking them away from their environment. And uh, it, it, be it requires a, a major adjustment. And so if we can have, for instance, even at the community level, what I have advocated, daycares, just like we have daycares for kids, for children, we can have daycares for the elder, elderly, where they are within the community. The other elderly people who would be at that daycare are people whom they know from their community. It would facilitate the family in going to work, not having to institutionalize those elderly people, whether it be their parents and so on. And that on evenings, just like you do with your children, you. You, you meet them and take them home and so on. I think that can go a long way in reducing the, the burden on the institutions and at the same time making um, improving the quality of life of the elderly and at the same time facilitating the family members who have no choice but to go out to earn an income. And so I, you know, I advocate greatly that government work jointly with the society. The, the society has a big part to play in this, but of course that is not an application of the responsibility of government. Government has a role to play. But having said so, there are far-reaching implications, you know, having made that statement. For example, when we look at retirees, we look at providing the income that government requires and so on. We need a population. I have said so on had many fora, and uh, some people raise their eyebrows when I say so. I mean, in the 70s and 80s, we recall that we went on a massive population campaign. That campaign was to reduce or to control our population. That was coincidentally very successful. Too successful. Too successful. <laughs> Back in the day, we had over 4,000 children being born. Calypso's have documented, cataloged that. Today, we probably have less than 2,000 children being born, and that is evident in the school population. We see now, while we were on a shift system some years ago, 
we have underpopulated schools today. To the point that some some have to be facing closure. Closure, yeah. I think that was an error on my on our part. I, I certainly believe so. You cannot have an economy without a population. And secondly, you need a population sufficiently strong in numbers to provide your pensioners with the resources, to provide your tax base, and to provide the, the right environment for business. And so we have to be very careful that you know we adopt the right policies. And, um, if, and even after we adopt policies, I do not see the supporting, the supporting moves that are made based on surveys, analysis, and evaluation of what we are doing. Because if we were carrying out the right evaluation, there are schools that were recently built that should not have been. Mm -hmm. We should have known that with the depletion of the population, the school population would very have very dwindled. That brings me to another factor documenting data, doing research. As a policymaker, how do I determine what is the right policy to adopt? Do we just arbitrarily adopt policy? Are we guided by information? And the information that we have to be guided by is derived from research. There's not enough of that happening in St. Lucia. And so even my ministry is looking more seriously at carrying out research, for example, when it comes to poverty and providing for the needs of, of poor people, our social protection programs are looking at a serious registry. Now, when we talk about registry, we have to go out there and find out in reality how many poor people are there, who are the poor people. And that how do we define poverty? And now? how do we define poverty? Now, the thing about it is, currently, we take action, we put policy in place to assist what we consider as the lesser fortunate people. Government provides subsidies, for instance. I have said so for many years now. They subsidize rice, flour, sugar, gasoline, and everything. But they subsidize it for you, they subsidize it for me, and they subsidize it for the poor people. Why should a government minister be subsidized? I mean, when we look at, uh, the po we look at poverty, they certainly do not qualify for that subsidy. There are millionaires in St. Lucia who enjoy that subsidy. That should not be. Think of the gasoline situation. Government subsidizes gasoline. Martinicans come to St. Lucia to buy gasoline. So you are, in fact, subsidizing. And I'm not picking a war with our neighbors. I'm just saying, you know, we have to be very careful at, at, at how we pitch our social programs that it serves a purpose because millions are going to the wrong targets. Whereas those millions could be saved and you utilize for the benefit of the same people who should have been targeted. So that registry will provide better targeting and so we'll be more effective in meeting the needs of those who need the social protection. Yep, so this it's quite obvious that your portfolio really zeroes in a lot on the society and the whole um, culture of the, the society, the indoctrination and how people are you know, brought into society, the society development. For example, the aspect of the care for the elderly, uh, as you mentioned, and how difficult it would be. We brought up the example of probably more persons, you know, staying closer to their parents, their grandparents, mm -hmm. rather than having them institutionalized. Mm -hmm. How difficult would it be to get the society as a whole to buy into this concept and to realize that they staying closer, <coughs> maybe forgetting the excuse of they do not have time, they don't have no one at home mm -hmm. to stay with them, and it's, it's a bit burdensome for them to go out and work and take care of them, but to let them know that just they making that sacrifice will, in the end, in the long run, be of great benefit to the Senation society. I think a great part of it is education. If we inculcate those values in our people from the school level, I think we will have a much better success rate at achieving this. Because in Japan, for example, an elderly person is seen as an institution. They are highly respected, highly regarded, and treated with reverence. And so you do not turn your back on elderly people or you know, like, for example, your elderly family members. We also have to begin to teach people that while we advance along with development and progress, there are some practices that we should retain or return to. And I am referring here now to the extend extended family concept that we used to have. Where in the same yard you had auntie, grandmother, mother, children, cousins, 
And so not only can you better pool resources, but say for example, caring for younger ones, passing on information to younger ones, and so on. But now we have greater independence. Everyone goes on their own as soon as possible. That brings about loneliness, lack of support, support systems, and so on. You have young children having children. Children who should be parented are becoming parents. They know nothing about parenting. That is where they could get the support from their mothers, their grandparents, and so on. And so their children would have proper parenting because it would have been available to them anyway within the extended family structure. I, I say so, and I'm not necessarily advocating that we go back to exactly what existed in the past where you had 10 people in one room. That's not what I'm saying. But even if it means that you have, for example, when government is looking at housing duplexes where you know, just wall separates that other family from the other, but you just go around the wall and you know, the assistance is right there, the presence is, is right there, and so on. When you meet in the yard, there, values can be inculcated. I mean, the, the handing down of traditions and cultures and everything like that can be facilitated there. So it is a rebuilding of an institution in itself. It is like recapturing what we once had that made us who we are. I think we have lost some of that, and it is to our parents. Now, you spoke earlier about our population and how we are beginning to draw towards the end of being underpopulated. It's a very mm -hmm. scary thing. Yeah. Uh, how do we begin to turn this, the situation around? I think it's a delicate, <laughs> very, very thin line. <laughs> because in our society today, you have the idea that um, women are very career-focused, not necessarily focusing on families, and if they do, perhaps later on in life you give a thought or two about settling down. Right. Um, men are also doing the same thing, trying to push ahead. So how do we now create that balance in the minds of our nationals and not trample on what people believe is their right mm -hmm. for them to choose whether they want to be in a family or begin a family or not? See, it has a lot to do with values. Today, we are, we are mostly driven by careers. And I will not start having a family until I have established my career, until I am, I am established in my career, and so on. Very often, people have children very late in their lives. They look at the financial implications of having children because people plan a lot further ahead. It is very expensive, by the way, to have children. And while I'm not advocating that the state gets involved to that extent to dictate to people, but if we recognize let us not forget, I, I know a lot of people don't like to hear that our primary purpose in life is procreation. <laughs> that is what it is. Don't and let the Me Too movement hear you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it is. And if we are concerned about, I talked ab about the sustenance of certain social amenities and services and so on, even your, your pension and things like that. But if we are to even think about the survival of our species, yes. We have to consider that. And so we should place a greater premium on family. But are we capable of going the route of some of the um, other countries, you know, in Europe? Um, I know Japan is now looking at that because they too are in that very doldrum. Yeah. Um, incentivizing. That's right. And our can incentives. Can we do that? Yes, we can. Our incentives may, very well, may have to be different to theirs because we are not a, as rich a nation as mm -hmm. they are. But if there is, if I know that there is proper daycare facilities, for example, early childhood education centers, that makes life easier for me with my child. If we go back to the extended family structure, the burden of re rearing a child, raising a child, nurturing a child becomes a lot lighter. If with the very family values that we have, the support system would be in place because you have, I'm, I'm not a single parent, there are you know, many people, not just my spouse, but other members of the family who chip in where needs be and so on. I think there are things government can do to incentivize without going overboard given the limited resources that we have. Facilitation, that's what, that's what I'm talking about there right now, putting some institutions in place, get to the point where we make education, for example, cheaper. That is one of the big elements that is of concern and um, ensuring that we have job opportunities and that is what most governments aim to do 
bring about investment, um, create the right environment for thriving commerce and business development. If all of that is in place, then I don't see a problem. I think we can have an economy that can sustain a, a, a bigger population, uh, the bigger population that will sustain the economy. Now, just this week, I heard the Prime Minister Barbados, Mio Motley, speak to this very issue and uh, at a town hall meeting on the CSME, mm -hmm. and uh, because you know it's facilitated free movement within CARICOM, and she was speaking to the idea of, of manage the migration because all of the islands are now beginning to grapple with the possibility that underpopulation is going to have dire consequences for the yeah. performance of the economies. Mm -hmm. So is that something well, that we could have a broader well, discussion well, on? Well, there are options. I mentioned one option, having more children, bigger families. You introduce a new option of migration. However, well, that must be... Uh, 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 that has to be uh, immigration. That has to be carefully managed, because you know you just mentioned the fact that we are a small nation with a small population. Well, given the fact that we are a small nation with a small population, we could easily be overrun. Our culture, our values, our tradition can easily be usurped with the influx of people of a different culture who can come in and dominate our society. That you do not want if we want to maintain our identity, maintain who we are as a people our culture, our traditions, and so on. I think we should be in a position where they are welcome, but they have to assim be assimilated into what exists here rather than impose upon us what they bring here. So we're going to take a break yeah. on our program right now. We'll be back on In Focus. Life is in me a red and rich supply for life that flows and helps us to survive. Without it, I am dying. You share it, I am living. Without it, I am dying. You share it, I am living. On you, I am dependent. Don't let me down A pint from you I'm needed to Turn my life around So come along, donate, donate, donate My heart is beating What's in the food you're eating? Do you really even know? All the chemicals and hormones used to accelerate their growth. All the artificial flavoring, sweeteners and colors too. We consume and we don't spare but thought for the damage that they'll do. No, think about the children. Think about the children. How will we save them? Chemicals and GMOs are not the solution. Use organic and join. Excessive agrochemical use, additives, and genetically modified foods are harmful to health and the environment. Join the good food revolution. Grow, buy, and consume organic. A message from Rice St. Lucia and the Ministry of Sustainable Development with funding from the GEF Small Grants Program, UNDP. The Good Food Revolution. Thanks for staying with us in focus and we are getting well into our segment with our guest, who is the Minister for Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment, the Honorable Leonard Mottu. So Mottu, just before we go too far away from one of the main points that you had mentioned in your previous discourse, that of the real absolute necessity for research and what would actually guide 
-hmm. your, your, your ministry because you need to know the numbers, you need to know what areas need strengthening. We know that is a very crucial area. I think that even in times of budget, it's quite important for you to know these numbers because I think there was a toolbox concept yeah. as to what was necessary, what you needed to, to remedy them. So maybe we can just spend a, just a, a few moments looking at the whole aspect of research and the importance of it to your ministry. Yeah, well, it is very important. Um, by and large, we are guided to a great extent by the information that we get from the statistics department. We are also dependent on the uh, country poverty assessment that is done every decade. I think we are on the cusp of having another one conducted right now, which will provide us more up-to-date information as to what the actual situation is. Finding out the actual situation is twofold. It tells us where we are, as well as how successful or unsuccessful our programs have been in the last 10 years. And so even statistics from Ministry of Finance is, is very important to us when they talk about unemployment data because as a social uh, ministry we look at providing training providing job employment um, job opportunities um, entrepreneurship and so on to take people out of poverty because we don't only want to work with people and provide uh, social protection for them but we want them to graduate as well out of that category and so we will determine our success by the extent to which the numbers uh, are favorable or unfavorable and so the research is very important in that regard and of course when it comes to policy formulation you would be guided you know to a great extent by, by that information and so we have a social unit in the in the, the social department but it is very limited in staff and capacity and so on and so we depend on other agencies for that but I think if Every department, not just in our ministry, health, agriculture, education, every department does better documentation, then the information could be more readily available. And when I say education, you may ask, what does education have to do with? The education would be able, the Ministry of Education will tell you how many children are perhaps unable to meet their needs in terms of school supplies, in terms of being able to have the meals that they need to access transportation and all of those things and we are party to you know the resolution to such problems because we provide bursaries on an annual basis for children so who are those children the ministry of education is best placed to assist us in knowing who they are you know uh, well the tr school transportation subsidies dealt with by the ministry of education but when our social workers encounter families who have in difficulty find out their children are not going to school why aren't they going to school because they cannot afford transport then you see where we you know, overlap mm -hmm. in the sense that we should be working collaboratively with other ministries to ensure that we provide the requisite um, coverage for the people who really need it. So yes, research is very important. Um, gathering data and analyzing, not just gathering data, but yes. analyzing the data and utilizing it to guide our policy and programs. And I know research played a, g a great deal yeah. with um, the Senusha Social Safety um, Net. That's right. Earlier this year, you went to Grenada to see what that experience was like over there. And, and they, their program is dubbed SEED, Support for Education, Empowerment and Development. Right. How did you find that experience, juxtaposing that to what we want to do here? Uh, very good, very useful. I mean, uh, I must admit that in that regard, they are a step ahead of us. What we want to do is not just to copy carte blanche wholesale what it is they have done, but to study it see what is applicable to our, our needs, tailor it to our needs, and where mistakes, where there are pitfalls, to avoid those pitfalls. And so I think it was a very useful exercise. I mean, we, we look at what they have done, for example. They too have a, pop a problem with uh, mm, the uh, declining school population. What they have done with some of their schools in terms of transforming it into the various institutions for young boys, girls, and, and so on. That is very useful. Their, re their registry has served a, a tremendous purpose. And the way they have been able, through technology, IT, to integrate the various services that they provide. Because let me just say something to you. While it is true you want to provide services to underprivileged poor people, people who are indigent, you want to ensure that you provide, it, provide the, the services 
to the targeted people, those who actually need it. At the same time, it is not beyond the people who need it to abuse the system. And so you have overlaps, you have double dipping. You have people who are beating the system by getting more than their fair share. And some people, you know, make a career of, of doing that. And even in our little system, because they understand the system, they know where there are loopholes and they exploit it. That can be avoided by collaboration, by utilizing the technology where this department knows what's going on in that other department. They know what coverage you give to whom and so on. And so when SSDF provides bursary, they would have known that you would have gotten bursary from Ministry of Education or from the Social Services Unit or whatever other source that exists. And so this is what we are trying to do now, to have a tighter, more targeted system in place, using the research, the data, uh, utilizing underutilized resources like the schools that are now being closed down and having that registry that will provide guidance to us. Now, you, um, you expressed some frustration about our situation in St. Lucia because you're saying that they have an estimated $34 million that is um, being allocated towards poverty reduction <laughs> on island. $34 yeah. million. Dollars. And yet you see that we've not made significant gains at all in targeting the problem. Mm -hmm. Well, when you, when you consider the needs of the indigenous the needs of the poor, it is uh, wide. I mean, just let me indicate to you the various departments that we have. We have the welfare unit that provides um, public assistance, provides burial assistance, provides emergency housing, you know, such services to individuals. We have the social services unit where the social transformation officers go at the community level to work with people, get them more in engaged and involved. You have the local government, which has a role to play as well. We have um, a number of agencies. Well, we have human services, children who have problems with the law and children who need protection. Human services comes in there. They are also responsible for the elderly as well, and you know people who face abuse and things like that. You have a number of institutions, Boys Training Center, Upton Garden Center, Comfort uh, Home for the Elderly, Comfort Bay Home for the Elderly, a Transit Home, and so on. All of those institutions have to be financed and have to be provided for. Then you have a number of agencies like the SSDF, you have NCA, you have Bell Fund, all of whom, you know, collaboratively with the ministry provide services. And we also provide assistance by way of stipends, by, by way of, you know, sponsorship and so on to agencies that are quasi-government or private institutions. We, I mean, now we are looking at, for example, the situation in Cornerstone, where there is a, a problem, and we are, you know, s looking at the, the situation right now to see where we can come in to assist. Upton Garden is not, strictly speaking, a government-run entity, but we provide um, subven a subvention to them for administrative purposes uh, and so on. So, our reach is wide, is far. Our the, the demands on us is extensive, it's great, and so as a result, the resources is simply not adequate. And I say so, bearing in mind that we have limited resources and that there are contending demands for those same resources because health is important, education is important, I mean, you name it, there are other areas that has to be attended to, but I'm an advocate for social services. <laughs> so yes. that is what I'm talking about now. Now, yeah. within, you mentioned that the Upton Garden Girls Center, Boys Training Center, that falls, the portfolio. With the <coughs> recent incident at the mm -hmm. Border Correctional Facility and the 16-year-old um, accused, the pressure, and certainly rightfully so, mm -hmm. is on for the country to be able to have proper facilities to deal with children who are in conflict with the law. Correct. Yeah, that is have you begun that conversation in your ministry on yes, how we we're doing that? Yes, we have. And uh, I have been around and in government long enough that I've learned not to speak prematurely. However, I can tell you that we have been having that, that conversation and we are optimistically looking forward to hoping that it will come to fruition because the World Bank is, is looking at the proposal to fund 
an institution that will replace Upton Gardens Transit Home Boys Training Center and will at the same time provide the ideal facilities for people of that age who are in conflict with the law where they can be incarcerated. And I know you are a results-oriented person. Yes. So over the years, we've had some intervention programs like mm. that, the Boys Training Center. And as you rightfully said, you have uh, young men there for care and protection and those who are in conflict with the law. Yes. Rehabilitative, uh, rehabilitation programs. What has been the success rate of, mm. or how, do you, how does your ministry even begin to measure what is a success rate let for rehabilitation programs? Well, let me say, first of all, that uh, there are some success stories. I'll be the first to say, certainly not to the extent that we would like to see. I think the success stories should be accentuated far more. For example, at the Boys Training Center, we have an individual who has done the CVQ level one and two successfully. We have uh, a young man who has done so well that he has gone overseas in Guyana to represent St. Lucia and was chosen in that forum to go to the Dominican Republic as an advocate for boys who you know have gone through the, the system and so on we have a musician a young man who is an accomplished musician now a, a panis if that's what they call people who play yeah. pan yeah. <laughs> you know? yes. and and you know these are, are people who have done well there are others who have gone on in society and holding decent jobs uh, and so on you see yes we, we don't necessarily in our society talk of the, the, the good deeds and highlight the positive stories we speak more of the negatives and I'm not saying that we shouldn't I believe that a lot more can be done because we offer programs like agriculture auto mechanics um, and we do literacy and numeracy for the boys who need that assistance and so on but the extent to which is it, it is offered I think those programs are not funded sufficiently the facilities are not adequate and so on so I'm hoping that with the advent of a new institution that all of that would be taken into account and we would cater for what is required to ensure that we have a more successful program that is conducted for, for those individuals. It's quite obvious that your ministry absorbs a lot of pressure yes. on the demands of the society. That's right. Based on what we've discussed so far in terms of you're involved in almost every tentacle of development in St. Lucia and all the social aspects. Adolescent survey Mm -hmm. We know that it's something that is continuous yeah. within the ministry and that is a very important area because out of that you will get the impact on social ills. We, did, so we, say we didn't want to sp we often speak of the mm -hmm. ills rather than the positives, right. but I'm sure that's one area. And mm -hmm. also the after school program, maybe like to okay. look at how those are impacting on the work of your ministry and the, well, and the ability to solve some of the problems that we have. Well, we consider the after school program to be a flagship program in our ministry. Reason being, when you look at young people who engage in criminal activity, who engage in deviant behavior, who have social adjustment problems, very often it is young people who are neglected, who do not get the requisite attention that, and guidance that they need. And so it is revealed in the, real, the different forms and they act in different ways because of that deficiency. The, the after school program, assist young people who would otherwise be on their own because let us not forget today even when there are two parents both parents have to work to make ends meet and so within certain hours even when they work daytime within certain hours there's no one at home the children normally come from school at 2 30 3 o'clock parents are still at work until after 4 30 and never get home before 5 36. So do, how do they account for those hours? I think the after school program is playing a major role because you, you can never tell how they could be led astray during that time. But during that time, we have programs where they can be assisted, those are weak, who are weak academically. There are those who can get involved in extracurricular activities such as IT, sports, theater, music. You know, and we have some very successful programs. I mean, if I, if I must say, the one I'm most familiar with in my constituency, the Moshi After School Program, a very successful program. I mean, I am so astonished every time I see the Moshi After School Band perform. By the way, I, know, I, I just want them to know that I've not forgotten their request for new equipment. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, you can see the success, the difference that it makes. I mean, as a young person, Myself, who grew up with a single parent who worked at the hotel, my brother and I were on our own quite a lot. It was not a structured program, but 
Ryan, you would know sports play, played a big role. Sports came in and saved a lot of us. Yes. Not only does it engage you in something that is productive, but the self-esteem that it provides to the average individual, all of a sudden these people see themselves, have some of the ego, the yes. self-esteem and the pride that they, they develop in themselves. It goes a long way in shaping them as an individual, in building character and so on. So I think it is difficult to measure the impact of programs like this, but I have no doubt in my mind that those programs play a significant role. And that's why I refer to it as a flagship program. And we have quite a number of communities where this is done now. Because of the success of those programs, we are looking to expand, you know, and incorporate more communities. And so there I want to just make a little picture. The private sector can chip in and assist as well, <laughs> you know. Uh, we'd be happy because when they help, they would avert a lot of potential problems in society that would impact on their business. And so, you know, that is one program. You mentioned another another program, you have another uh, after school program. There's a YEP, yep, yeah. program for yes. the Central Castries Basin. Yes. Where we know because it's a city, urban area, we know we have a lot of problems there. And so that program is financed by the Caribbean Development Bank. We have millions of dollars that is going to be utilized, over two million dollars, and we have another eight hundred thousand US dollars as a grant plus the government is making uh, a contribution now that program is very diverse you have the community policing you have the youth diversion you have you know after school an after school component to it and so on our ministry is not the sole agency responsible for implementing because when it comes to policing of course that's home affairs the diversion program home affairs also has a part to play the uh, after school ministry of education and so on so it is a multi-sectoral uh, uh, sectorally run program that is geared and targeted at those city youth where we have quite a lot of problems where we uh, you know some of the communities that is referred to as ghettos and so on we want to go in there and make an impact make a difference and not wait until things happen but to stem it you know nip it in the bud and to be proactive go in and work with them to avert the problems rather than to react after it has happened. I'm happy about the youth empowerment program because yeah. the house at the ministry I am as well in the same building and they did mention that actually we need to speak on that so happy that you're yeah. able to get that in. Yeah. We know that um, coming closer to the conclusion of the program we need to speak to a lot more of the areas in which you your portfolio covers and also some constituency matters we've got to take a, another break in a very short while so when we come back we're hoping to get into those aspects and to speak a bit more on the interrelation between your ministry and other, other government agencies we'll be back in focus One of the eight universally recognized rights of the consumer is the right to be heard. This means that every consumer who is dissatisfied with a good or service has the right to lodge a complaint to the provider of that good or that service. This should be the first point of lodging a complaint. Ensure that the receipt as proof of the transaction is available. Climat la terre a quand changé. Exact a affecté nous toutes. Cyclone qui a venu plus mauvais. Gros de l'eau et la prendre l'eau qui a détruit les animaux et plants. Quand la mer a venu plus chaud et qui a tué place qui se pressent dans la gravité. La main choua qui a aussi changé de manière se pressent qui a quitté l'un côté et allé à l'autre côté. Cette liste a contribué en petit usine gaz en l'espace. Quand un petit pays nous a essayé de faire tout ça nous a fait pour assurer qu'il nous baisse à sous quantité de gaz nous a servi pour empêcher la terre à venir plus chaud. Et faut pour baisser à sous quantité de gaz nous a servi, c'est mitigation. Le climat a changé. Il a changé depuis que nous avons tout au niveau de la terre, Kabouli, Gas, Will, et Chebon. Et ça, quand on est cause de la terre, il a changé plus chaud. Ça, nous avons fait actuellement même, c'est pour adapter. Nous avons fait tout ça nous a fait pour préparer et répondre pour ces conséquences négatives à la cause du changement climat. 
nous tout ça fait que choy. Par exemple, nous n'y pouvons assurer qui nous protecter tout ça nous cap planté. Servir fumier qui naturel. Pratique quand nous pour abattre de mange en temps cyclone et godlo. Construire canal pour l'eau courir bien quand il faut. Et assurer qui canal là par les ordi. Faites tout ça qui est possible pour vivre en temps changement climat ça. Trouvez plus d'informations à ce plan d'adaptation national gouvernement et des marches ou même ça prend pour protéger le corps et tout notre set les siens. Welcome back to In Focus, a program that highlights the policies and programs of the government of St. Lucia. And we're really hoping that you're part of our program today and that you're getting a bit more information as to the functions of the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment. And if you need some extra, you can call us on 468-2162 to be part of our program. So we continue with Minnesota's our guest in studio at this moment, the Honorable Leonard Motu. The social, the Senusha Social Development um, Fund, the SSDF, big part, great partner for your ministry. Mm -hmm. um, funding, I know for some time, as you indicated earlier, has always been an issue. For the SSDF, it is, they rely heavily on mm -hmm. being able to be funded in order for them to carry out so many mm -hmm. of the various areas that they provide in services for. Mm -hmm. um, give us an update as to where the SSDF is at and plans on how you're going to further strengthen its capacity. Okay, forgive me, but before I answer your question, I'll make a pitch. We have just started the budget process. <laughs> and uh, last year, our budget dwindled a little we did not get some of what we requested and uh, we don't just arbitrarily make requests we are mindful of of the limitations and so when we request what we actually need not necessarily all that we want and i say so because i'm hoping that uh, next year we will fare far better in terms of the demands that we make we also try to help ourselves by reaching out to raise funds i know the ssdf has reached out to the, the diaspora and there is, I think, the St. Lucia Overseas Association. Yes, yes. They are working with them to, you know, and that has borne fruit, is, is in the process of bearing fruit. I know they have worked with Lucilec and the Massey Stores, and they are sponsoring a program called Our Boys Matter, which is under the auspices of, S of uh, SSDF. But uh, under the SSDF, we also have the Caregivers Program, where we provide care for homebound elderly people who are unable to take care of themselves and where the family cannot afford to pay for a caregiver. That is one program that is with them. We have a Kudme Setlisi. Kudme Setlisi is a program where we provide educational assistance, housing assistance, and some, some training as well, and help families. It is targeted more at families, and it helps families graduate out of, out of poverty. Then we have the HOPE program, which has a big training component. We have a micro-enterprise component, and we also provide educational assistance under the whole program. And uh, what other program do we have? Uh, if the SSDF, we have the BNTF program, which is a very big program that is by and large funded very heavily by the Caribbean Development Bank. And we have a number of grants, um, grant funded programs that we have, uh, projects rather, that we have under the, the BNTF, the Basic Needs Trust Fund. And um, what happens is the Caribbean Development bank provides about 75% of the resources and government will provide 25%. As we speak, there are a number of projects that are being undertaken. For example, in the area of access to proper sanitation and water, we have a water pro um, project taking place right now in Labon, where we have phase two of the Labon water project because while we, we touted the success of that project a few years ago, the people in central Labon, Labon proper, and towards Dofe were connected, but the people in lower Labon on the approach to Labon were not connected. So now we are going to connect an additional 40 people, households rather not people, but households to that project. Vsequi. Now you see, the problem is I'm saying so because my 
community, my constituency is seen as an affluent constituency, and the image and concept and perception of my constituency is skewed by the fact that there are a couple affluent communities like Bonte, Rodney Bay, and Cap Estate. I do have rural communities, I do have poor communities. Vesiqui, to this day, as we speak, there are many households in Vesiqui without my bond water. That is going to be a thing of the past because I'm hoping that in, by December we can launch the program where that water program will take place where we have to do piping, we have to do uh, upgrade of the pumping system and set up a water tank to supply all households in that area with, with pipe borne water. And I don't want you to think that because I use those examples, the only place that that is happening is my constituency. We have a similar program taking place in Pasias as well right now. There is the early childhood education centers that are being built. One is being built in Moshi. Yesterday we had the signing ceremony and a contractor has been engaged and within the next eight days he has to begin construction of the early childhood education center. That gives me an opportunity to say a few things about my constituency by the way. And yes. so we have one that is going to be happening in Jackmel. We have one that's going to be happening in Miku as well. And these are heavily funded by the Caribbean Development Bank, for which we are very grateful, and we must express our sincere thanks, because these projects go a long way in providing facilitation to the people who need it, people who require that kind of social assistance. Um, uh, there are a number of roads as well that are going to be funded under that program, because you see the Basic Needs Trust Fund, I think we have Basic Needs Trust Fund ninth program now. And depending on the eight, seven, nine, or whatever program it is, there are different focus. Some, uh, sometimes it is a focus on education, focus on sanitation and water, focus on access, which means roads and so on. So right now, we are looking at sanitation, education, and access. And so these programs are under, uh, under those programs. And so I just wanted to mention it because, you know, we want to express our thanks and at the same time say to those communities that relief is on the way because those programs, we have identified the funding and they are actually being launched right now. I'm hoping that by August next year, all of those programs will have been completed. And we can call us on 468-2162 if you have a question for the minister. And Lisa, you've been monitoring the Facebook. Is there any questions coming in so far? Well, we do have comments uh, from Marie Swanson. She was saying that it's a great idea for the uh, daycare for the elderly. And she was wondering if Senusha had such an institution and there's too many seniors. She's agreeing that too many seniors are being left alone and that she's hoping to return home one day to help with uh, the care of the elderly in Senusha. So we can take it that she's living overseas and yeah. um, involved in, in, in that work. Um, because, and you mentioned earlier the idea of private sector involvement as mm -hmm. well. Right. Oversight, because I think we've had one or two in, um, businesses open up providing services uh, to uh, for the elderly in a situation if we were to have a proliferation of this oversight would be under your ministry, would ministry it? yes it would be yes. and of course to provide adequate efficient and appropriate oversight we would need to have policies in place we would have we need to have standards set why don't we have a policy yet for the well elderly? Like, like i said <laughs> well i don't know that's that's a, a shame really and uh, you pr might notice there's a little embarrassment on my part because, <laughs> I mean, we are the ones who have that responsibility and I've been pushing for that to happen. I've spoken to my peers about it. We both agree that that is, you know, an imperative and that we should give it the, the requisite importance that it deserves and as soon as possible to get it done. I, I was about saying that there is such an institution in Leclerc, for example. Yes, yes, I'm familiar with yeah, this one. And um, people like Miss Ellen Charles and yes. those people are in that. And from all indication, is running successfully. I believe that we need to have more of these. And uh, of course, we want to encourage private sector investment in those areas. I think it's a niche market that is there to be exploited at the same time, provide uh, a service because government uh, cannot always provide all that is needed. And of course, even not just for disadvantaged people, but even uh, more affluent people who, c who can afford to pay, but may require the service. So, you know, there's a place, there's a place for it as well. And um, so I want to say to the, the caller, yes, there is such an institution, but now we are pushing to establish. I'm, I'm desperately trying to establish one in my constituency of Grosley. It's a promise that I've made. 
difficulty is to get an institution, uh, a building, a structure where we could do that. I'm trying to go the route of retrofitting an existing structure. I'm looking at the possibility of a purchase of a structure. I'm looking at the possibility of the old police station. Of course, there are a number of things earmarked for that old police station, a lot of contending parties looking to utilize it. I, I know that the Ministry of Home Affairs is looking for a house for court, for the court. And they were looking at the Grocery Human Resource Development Center. I certainly do not support that move. Initially, I didn't have a problem with it, but when I thought about it and the number, the number of um, activities that will be taking place there, you have a theater, you have a music lab, you have a training room, you have a, a conference area. When you think about it, court takes precedence of all of those things. So if it's caught there, nothing can happen there. At the same time, there's a security issue and, and all of that. Uh, I think it's just too complicated. The retrofitting of the building, though they say it will be temporary, I do not know what temporary means in St. Lucia. Sometimes temporary means can mean temporary can mean 50 years. So I, <laughs> I don't trust that word, that word. And so at the same time, you know, we don't want, if, if they move out eventually, with the retrofitting not going to be done and all of that, you know, it can uh, compromise the use of the center, so to speak. So I would prefer if we can perhaps refurbish the grocery police station, the old police station, and have them utilize there as, uh, as a, a courthouse instead. Well, not right, to go into that, no, I think it's a good time to look at some matters put in into your constituency, unless Lisa has something that she wants to follow but up. But I do want to follow up that. on the family court. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we're moving into the observance of international men still later on this month. And under the social justice, many men crying out there that they can't seem to find a strong voice in the system. There's almost like no support given mm. to them. Okay. Um, there are men who are facing real difficulties with being able to have access to their children, um, uh, being able to just have a fair share when it comes to the family court. Um, your thoughts on, on what's happening with, with fathers uh, uh, within uh, the system. Well, I have, I've publicly spoken on that. I mean, first of all, let me just comment on the fact that the men, are lo you said men are looking for a voice and it's almost as if men are in a sense neglected and so on. I think um, we brought that to an extent on ourselves because of our disposition. We, you know, by tending to show that we're strong and macho and all of this kind of thing, people figure, well, okay, you can take care of yourself, you don't need help. But the fact is, there are men who are crying out for help. There are men who require help, who require support. And I'm talking about International Men's Day. It's not even a, a subject. I mean, you brought it up as a surprise that you even knew that. And so I, I think more has to be done when you talk about child support. I am an advocate that parents, whether men or women, have to take the responsibility. They should be obligated to take the responsibility of parenting the, child, the children that they're responsible for. But when a father is unable to provide for his children or child, we should investigate the reason. If it is as a result of unemployment, I don't think we should apply the same punitive measures that you do to a father who can and does not. There are men who wish to, who do when they can, but find themselves in unfortunate situations where they are unable to. And to incarcerate those men for that purpose, I think, is a disservice to society as a whole. You are destroying that man who does not have bad intentions, who is not a, ba a bad person, who has not willfully committed any, any offense, you're not helping the children. You're making it more difficult for that father when he comes out of prison with all the stigmatization that exists in our society from getting a job, for the image that he carries, you, you know, put, put in the children in jeopardy because while he's incarcerated, the children are not going to be cared for anyway. I think what the system should do is to provide employment from even our social programs. Okay, now I'm saying for me, my ideal job may be X. If I cannot find a job doing X, and I really care about my children, and you offer me why, I should, in the interest of my children, accept it. So I'm saying that we can absorb those people in our social programs, find them employment, and ensure that they meet the needs of their children. That, I think, is a far more productive, far more efficient, and successful way of dealing with the issue rather than just incarcerating men and sending them to prison. And I think the mm -hmm. other side of that coin too is women and where their responsibilities lie, not just as the nurturer in the traditional sense, because right. there are men who have, 
you know, custody, not necessarily legally, but the children are living with them. Right. But the mothers are not contributing That's right. to and these children. And so well, uh, if we're looking for equality, it must come across the board. And the court doesn't the hold them yeah. the responsible for it. Yeah, uh, if we're looking for equality, it must come across the board. I mean, you are a parent as well. You have a role to play as well. And I, I support the view that the, pe the mother should contribute and play a role equally as the father should. And so in that way, we will, you know, like we are hoping that we don't have to force people to carry out and, and, and own up to their responsibilities. But if needs be, then I think it should be done. Mr. Minister, we're just winding down. We're given an opportunity now to, to focus on some aspects of your constituency that you really like to talk about. Yes. I mean, I, I mean, in the little time you have, I cannot possibly speak of all that there is to be, to be spoken of. But I want to specifically zone in on roads. I think by far that is the sole biggest, the single biggest problem for us in our constituency. I mean, we are by far the most roads. I keep saying so. I have to drill that in. We are by far the most roads and by far the most deplorable roads. Many of my communities, all they ask for, proper roads. And Just hold, hold on yeah. to that thought and let's say good morning <laughs> to the caller. Thanks for calling in. You're in focus. Hello, good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Yes, okay, there, so yes. are you near your television set? Yes, yes, the noise is in the back. Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Hello. Yes, go ahead, please, with your question. So. We're with you, caller. Go ahead. You had a question for the minister or comment? Hello. Yes, go ahead, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. The minister, the minister, Mr. Bontut. Good afternoon to you, sir, and ladies and gentlemen. I'm calling from overseas, when we need Bermuda to be exact. I would like to know if you are going to sit, sit by and listen to the SLP ruin you all and tell us all kind of things knowing that you all have faith in them you're not exposing expo them I think it's time for them so let's not take those guys to the to, to the board you know what I'm saying let's guys respect you all so come back and let those guys just, just ruin the party then ruin the assassin then using ruin the government name you guys, you guys gonna attack those guys, I'm gonna jump in this guy's case, man, and put them in the fridge. For that obviously that they found it, they're crafting the, the worst, the worst uh, obligation in the industry of the solution. You know what I'm saying? And I'm telling you that those guys just sit back there, and you have things with them, you're gonna you're, you're attack them. You know what I'm saying? It stands for those guys to be found in, in, in Berlin. You know what I'm saying? I'm okay, saying I don't, what? Right. I want to apologize, Scott, to say that we <laughs> in here, we were unable to hear you clearly. Uh, so we want to apologize for that. We really did try. I don't think the producer was able to deal with the feedback. Uh, are you still online? Okay, so we lost that corner. We apologize for that. He did say he was calling from overseas, yeah. and I think that it, there was some interference with that. So we apologize. Uh, but... I can't even begin to, to summarize what you were saying because we couldn't hear it at all. Um, but, you, Mr. Minister, you were speaking about some of the things happening in the Groselay area. But I want to speak about the village, village tourism. That's coming yes. to Groselay. Yes. It's a, it's a, you know, we've, we've um, the government has identified tourism as being one of the drivers mm -hmm. for the economy. Right. So plans for village tourism within that within the constituency can you give us a little insight because a lot of people believe like what grocery it's a town village tourism don't well, quite get it grocery is a town i mean but um, when you look at the little enclave that we have that was originally grocery it has the village feel and you know when we talk of the village we're not referring to the status of the community but we're referring to the feel and, and, and the atmosphere, the ambience of, of the commun community, so to speak. I mean, people speak of Rodney Bay Village as well, you know, and so when we talk of, of village tourism, we are thinking of, but I'm sp thinking specifically of what we would call the town, 
where we can develop more entrepreneurship among the locals to ensure that we get a larger share of the tourist dollar because as you would appreciate in some of the all-inclusives for example not much filters out of the hotels some of which are foreign owned the more of the dollar that we can retain within our economy would be far better for us because if a local uh, craft vendor or a sports provider a restaurant owner in the town of Grosley can get a, a share of, of that tourist dollar then what does he do he will patronize the other community services and, and businesses and as a result because I believe strongly in wealth distribution I believe strongly in the circulation of wealth at the ground what I, what I refer to as the ground economy I think when that begins to happen we fare far better many more people you know benefit because you know like we can have a situation here where Ryan has a million dollars and they say we average in 300 and something thousand dollars and I don't even have three dollars in my pocket you know but if each of us can have they say a couple hundred thousand dollars I think it is far better as a whole so it brings about more equity it, you know it others better for the economy and for the pros prosperity of our nation as a whole and that is why we are eagerly looking at developing the waterfront assisting assisting the business people in the in the community to develop their businesses package it better make it more appealing more acceptable and to, to ensure that we provide them with the training to meet the requisite standards that would you know make it more, more marketable and you know pleasing to, uh, and to attract the, the clients that they're targeting, which is the tourists. I'm looking at a problem that is now existing at the Rodney Bay facility, and uh, to an extent at Pigeon Point, where yacht crews, not yacht, but cruise passengers, go to sunbathe, and they are in contention with the hotels, and uh, there's a conflict between yes. guests yes. from the hotels and yes. cruise ship passengers. And we have a, a beach lying waste and grossly, nothing taking place yes. there. So if we can bring those people to those, they can say, you have a lovely beach there, they can sunbathe there. At the same time, they can have access to doing water spots, for instance, renting a chair. Um, they have to eat and drink and so on. So we have more of the circulation, right? Not just in Rondi Bay or in Castries, but in the town of Grosile as well. Mm -hmm. So yes, that is the idea behind the village tourism and to make Grosile more aesthetically pleasing. Okay, just on, on that line, my final question before this uh, gets uh, for a question in two, maybe your your vision for, for Grosile uh, going forward. And someone meant, saw me today and said, where are you going right now? I told him what I was coming to do. And he said, okay, I want you to ask the minister a question for me in terms of the yachties <coughs> and the jetty at Grosile proper. Yeah. And the aspect of probably getting some light in there and security, and that will help in the time yeah. in the whole thing of the... <coughs> it's, a bit, it's a pity we don't have the time to go into details, but, yes. but uh, you mentioned the jetty. That will be, the Grosile waterfront will be a, right. a central focus right. of the Grizzly development. Right. I speak of it as the Grizzly Waterfront Development Program project. <coughs> Sorry. And we looking at re refurbishing the jetty with a view to accommodating dinghies, yachts and so on. So that the many yachts that you see at certain times of the year where there are over hundred yachts anchored in the bay will not just remain on the yachts, but they will yeah. find it inviting to come right. into the town of Grosile to do the shopping, to recreate, to socialize, and to spend some money. And so we are also targeting the Martinicans, who are our close neighbor, who are into boating to a great extent, and who already have that propensity to come to Grosily when we have activities like jazz, carnival, Grosily Day, what have you. We have to now position ourselves to be more inviting, to be more facilitating, and to retain more of the money that they bring and so that will play a vital role but I want to I want to quickly change gears because of the limited time sorry let me just have a drink and while the minister is just having a drink here I just want to thank you for your comments on Facebook and we have a comment here that <coughs> the praise of the minister uh, someone saying that the minister's his abilities and value uh, to the government um, is some underrated and he's a great asset <laughs> thank to, you. To the thank you. There. Thank you. Well, I very often, often I get compliments yeah. like this, <laughs> but I appreciate it. <laughs> Why do you think they think you underrated? Well, so you've been well, awfully quiet. Well, we're in a society of chess beating, so if you don't do that, then 
people don't think much of you. Okay. I, wa I want to talk about the road in Gros Ile. That is a major concern of mine. It is a major problem for my constituents. And I'm saying that within now and June to August next year, I want to embark on a major road rehabilitation and maintenance program in the constituency where we're going to see at least 40 or more roads rehabilitated. And I'm talking about comprehensive rehabilitation, not potholing. <coughs> now, there is the, what I refer to as the Taiwanese road project, the OECC project, that is the one that is funded by the loan from Taiwan. That so the tune of 42, 42 million. million dollars. Yes. That is already on the way. And I have quite a number of roads, I think some 17 roads identified to be rehabilitated on that program, under that program. We have actually started with the Casa Bar Road. We are just about to launch the start of the Piat Road. And there are a number of roads. I mean, I will have the time at town hall meetings and so on to go into it with the constituents. That will be done. I just want to say that Cap Estate, that, has, that is traditionally neglected when it comes to road repairs, is included. Casa Bar, as you, as you have heard, is included. Boseju, Bonte, Rodney Bay is included. So the affluent areas of my constituency are included. I will not be saying to them as their parliamentary representative that their roads are private roads and that it is not government's responsibility. It is our responsibility and we live up to that responsibility. Very good. I, didn't, I didn't just say that all the roads will be done, but they will see a significant improvement. I'm glad you mentioned Pierre. Yes. And so, at the same time, I don't want the rural areas to think that they are left out. A number of roads in Moshi, Grand Riviere, Marisil, Corinth, Brosilia will be done. And so, there is another program, other than the OECC. You know that we now pay $1.50 uh, in, in terms of a gas tax. And that was earmarked for road repairs, rehabilitation, and maintenance. Well, let's face it. We pay more than our fair share in those taxes. The most cars you'll find is from my area. So these people, apart from their property taxes and other taxes that they pay, they pay that gas tax as well. And so, they deserve the, the reward of the sacrifice that they are making to pay those taxes. I heard from the ministry that I have 19 roads on that program. I submitted more than 19, uh, by the way, 20 something. And I'm hoping that that will be rectified upward, you know, that we can probably get it. But if I get 19, that's starting to scoff at, it will bring me close to the 40 that I'm looking at. Having said so, it will not solve all of our problems, but it would alleviate our woes, our woes in terms of traversing those terrible roads tremendously. I would be a relieved person. I'd be satisfied as a parliamentary representative that I made a major dent because that would be by far the most ambitious, most successful road program ever undertaken, not just in the Grosley constituency, but anywhere on this island. Having said so, I just want to say that I'm still mindful of the fact that uh, I know of at least another 39 roads that can do with a touch-up and it is a continuous process. If Rome was not built in a day, <coughs> the limited resources that we have, I don't think I can build grossly in a day. But we are well on our way. I ask for the patience, tolerance, and understanding of my constituents. We have started, and it will be ongoing. You will see a number starting as we go along, going into next year. Ryan, I'm hoping by the end of next year, that I would have done my bit, that come 2021, that I'd be satisfied that we have made a significant dent and that, no, that is not when I'd be scrambling for you, Ryan, as a constituent to say that it is because of upcoming elections. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, Mr. I was, don't Mr. Was, Mr. Ryan Mr. Mr. was troubling me. Mr. Mr. was troubling me. Okay. But the silly <laughs> thing is, we, we, we the constituents, I'm hearing mm -hmm. some of the, 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 the complaints on the ground, so I'm happy that the minister yeah. will know that the people of Piata are also so making do I, comments. Do I now need to move to yes, the uh, Grosley constituency? You're free, you know Mr. Yes. You're, you're welcome anywhere. And speaking of well, we do yeah, have some anywhere. extra time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, producer, for giving us extra yeah. time. So then I can now ask the minister, speaking about moving, all of this big boom that's happening because we now have that influx mm -hmm. of people towards the north, towards Groselay. Yes. Uh, I, I'm not going to ask if you are concerned about this exponential growth in the constituency, but it put it, there are implications that's right. for the way this is happening. Yes. Um, and even under your ministry, you <coughs> have to be mindful in <coughs> the certain areas that we, we've spoken about before. Uh, so, have you given thought into uh, 
a discussion, sitting down with certain maybe planners and so forth, and watching how this constituency is developing vis-a-vis -vis other constituencies um, on island and what it means. So the economic activity that's taking place there, what's happening, and how it impacts other constituencies. Most definitely. For example, when we look at economy, I'm happy about the plans and the projects, that some of which have already begun in the south. That will ease the pressure in terms of the influx of people coming to grocery seeking economic opportunities. And why I say so? There are positives to it, but there are also negatives. Social ills accompany that influx and so on. Housing. I've spoken to the housing minister and I've said to him, yes, like every other constituency, I want housing projects. But the policy is we are providing housing for people of the constituency, especially young people, especially first-time house owners, for those people, not necessarily for incoming other um, citizens of other parts. That is because we are disproportionately overpopulated compared to other constituencies. I expect that by the next election, I, I, we're going to have over 25,000 voters in Grosily. Compare that to other constituencies where there are 7,000, 5,000 even voters. I have to meet the needs of every constituent. It is their re re right. It is my responsibility. However, if you're going to assure me that there will be equitable distribution of resources, I don't have a problem. But the reality is resources are never distributed equitably. And so if you're going to give me equal, uh, equal uh, distribution of resources, that cannot work for me. Because, Ryan, I'm, I'm, I'm twice your size. I should have two plates. You, should, you have one. Simple as that. And that does not happen, so it puts us at a disadvantage. That is why I've advocated for the cutting of the gross receipt to bring it more in line with, first of all, the requirements of the Constitution and more comparable to other constituencies. If I have three constituencies, well, not I, if we in Grosily have three constituencies, I'm not advocating for three constituencies just for the sake of increasing the government bill or representatives, you know. I'm saying so because it will redound to the benefit of the, of the residents. When you look at CDP, each constituency is allocated funds for, for small projects and for development in the constituency. Instead of getting $1 million, I'll get $3 million. Or oh, Grosily will receive $3 million and quite rightly so. When you look at some constituencies, what the, the geographical space, it is one third in some cases or less than what Grosley is. I've advocated that for years. The Labour Party, when they were in, in government, proposed a cut. Of course, it didn't only include Grosley. There were other constituencies and repre um, represent parliamentarians in other constituencies felt that in their case, it was not justifiable. So there was a challenge launch which stalled everything. But I've supported the proposal that the Labour Party made. I'm prepared to go with the proposal that the Labour Party made. It is unfortunate that I suspect that that may not be done before the next election. But I'm hoping that irrespective who forms the government after the next election, that they will be given top priority immediately after election. Because, you know, when you come too close to elections to do that, people accuse you of gerrymandering, it becomes a, a political football and so on. But if it is done very early where both parties has an input, has a say, and it is done properly, I think it would be, it would redound to the benefit of the constituents of Grosily. And I, I also am thinking of planning. We are at a big disadvantage with our five-year cycles, where if after every five years you have a change of government, you start over after every five years. I think that is counterproductive. That is a waste of resources, and that is not doing us any good. That is why I would like for a central planning agency, like a grocery development foundation, for example, come take, bring all the stakeholders to the table, if you want to say the Chamber of Commerce of Grosile, <laughs> um, the politicians, both parties, or how many parties there, there are existing, church leaders, community activists, clubs, schools, everyone, bring them together, formulate a plan, agree on that plan, endorse that plan, 
and the politician who wishes to represent Gosley is going to articulate how he's going to implement that plan. Not that you are there today, tomorrow I come with a totally different plan that in some cases totally obliterates what you have begun and just a waste of resources. I, these are the things that we have to start to look at and while we lament and complain about the fact that we are a poor nation, we are guilty of engaging in a lot of waste. And, you know, we can minimize that waste by doing sensible things, you know, such as what I'm suggesting here. So in terms of a plan for Grossley, there is a standard plan for the Grossley Waterfront Development. I articulated that plan. It, is, it was articulated during the, the reign of the last administration. And I'm back and I'm still with that plan because incorporated in that plan is a lot of my vision. There are a few minor differences and changes, but that we can, we can work out and iron out. But I want to say to the residents of Grosile that some work has been done. Not all the work has been done. Be reminded that I was given a term of five years. It's just about three and a half years now. By the end of the five years, judge me based on my performance. Judge me based on what I've delivered. I assure you that when it comes to roads, you will be blown away by the unprecedented success that we will have in Rose. And I say so because I have every confidence in my government that they will live up to the commitments that we have made. I say so as a representative because I know we deserve it as the highest tax-paying constituency in this country. And when you think of the, f the kind of taxes we pay for, property tax, for example, I am proposing to ensure that there's greater compliance, that the local, and I'm now Minister for Local Government, and I'm putting a proposal to government that local government be, invo be involved in the tax collection process. If it is done at the local level, there'll be greater compliance. If there's greater compliance, there'll be more revenue. If there's more revenue, there'll be a bit for a little, you want to call it, uh, some, some be retained by, the, by the, the, the constituency. I don't know if you want to call it a commission or what, what have you. It's not for me to work out what that ratio is between Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Local Government, and other agencies to decide how much is retained. I know I can do with a, a, an extra $10 million as a budget for my local co um, government council. If the Grizzly Council has $10 million at hand, then we can begin to see the true impact of local government. I'm advocating, by the way, that we begin, in my report, that we begin to introduce local government elections. That is not in our interests, so it's not something that we generally push. I'm asking residents, I'm asking voters, do not depend on politicians to push that. That will not be done, because politicians see that, see that as a way of taking power away from them. But I believe it is, by and large, forgetting our self-interest, selfish interest, that it is a way of nurturing leaders. It is a way of meeting the needs of the constituency in a more efficient manner. And, I, and if you really think about it, it's a way of supplementing and supporting the work of the parliamentary representative. And so I'll be advocating for that as well. And I, I just quickly said so, because I noticed I didn't really touch on local yes. government. Yes. I didn't yes. touch on local government. So these are the new initiatives that we're looking at as far as local government is concerned. I would prefer not to have to sweat about a pothole in your area, a grass to be cut on your road and so on. I would want to believe that my local government council has the wherewithal and the capacity to address something like that while I deal with, you know, larger, more macro issues concerning and affecting the constituency. Thank you very much, Mr. Mortu. Well, Lisa, we've gone over time or extra time and it's really incredible how the minister responsible for equity, social justice, local government and empowerment can actually get you a day's work of all those uh, mm -hmm. portfolios, also and a large constituency, constituency, yeah. constituency and yeah. even areas we didn't even speak about on yeah. local government. So really, Mr. Mortu, yeah. we really thank you very much for being here today. It was a uh, pleasure. We are happy that our audience were able to get a bit more inside as to the working of your it's ministry. It's a pity we couldn't hear the calls. Yes. Because yeah. I always like to feel the pulse of the, of the public and uh, not that I don't have a good grasp of what my people are thinking, but even people from the wider community, it's important because my portfolios 
spun across the island, you know, so. Once again, thank you for being part of our program today in focus. Thank you also for joining us and being part of our program today. I'm Ryan O'Brien, behalf of my co-host Lisa Joseph and the Ministry Swan of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment, Honorable Leonard Motu, saying goodbye.